Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles, where today we are going to be joining Pointy-Haired Jedi, where he is bottom tier, in a destroyer without a smokescreen, in a tier 9 battle here on the Two Brothers map. He is sailing, and I think this is the first time I've actually seen this ship, the Tribal Class Destroyer HMCS Huron. The Tribal Class were a very successful series of destroyers built by the Royal Navy for the Royal Navy, Royal Canadian and Royal Australian Navies during World War II. Uh, they served in every theatre of operations and often continued serving after the war with Huron herself and her sister ship Athabascan. And I'm pretty sure Canada's fighting us ship, HMCS Hyder, also seeing service during the Korean War. Sadly, of the multitude of tribals that were built during World War II, only one exists to this day, but she's in fantastic condition and she is HMCS Hyder on display in Ontario in Canada. The Huron, however, actually we'll come on to this in a moment. Note that he doesn't have a smoke screen though, that's probably the most important thing, and yep, there we go, he's about to get counter spotted while waiting for the rest of his team to start doing something about the enemy just there it is <laughs> the enemy destroyer who is contesting the cap circle with him huron doesn't get smoke but it does have very good stealth i mean it's not amazing stealth sub six kilometer stealth would be amazing but 6.2 is pretty good for tier seven You have to ask yourself though, and this was a question I was asking myself, because information on this ship is actually kind of limited and hard to come by. Uh, it doesn't have a World of Warships wiki page, for example, and I don't have one myself. But I was thinking, well, if we have HMCS Hyder at tier 7, and Hyder's amazing, why do we need the Huron at tier 7? Because they're both the same class of ship. And the difference appears to be, Huron does not get the Hyder's amazing crawling smokescreen. It doesn't get a smoke screen at all, but it does get a heal. And as the eye tie over there is finding out the hard way, in common with other British and Commonwealth destroyers, it gets great high explosive shells. Although, the Liberty over there does have pretty good semi armor piercing shells, so this isn't really a fight that Jedi wants to be in, but it's the fight that he's found himself in. Fortunately, he's not the only one shooting at this guy who is in flames and badly battered. Oh, there goes the damage control. He might actually make it out of here if he stops shooting. But he's going to be forced to leave the camp. I think Jedi was kind of hoping that that guy would get finished off by his teammates so he wouldn't have to expose his position again. But once the Kunaberti exercised the damage control and stopped shooting, it became pretty clear he was going to make it out of there alive. So Jedi risked a couple of shots. Uh, fortunately, the Kunaberti's teammates were even more reluctant to shoot at spotted destroyers than Jedi's teammates were. And speaking of spotting things, enemy submarine. The Jedi's going to want to get that guy to and take the cap as well. And fortunately, the Synop just got taken out, who would have posed the biggest threat as Jedi prosecutes that submarine. He's going to get spotted by aircraft here, so there's no sense in having the AA guns off. He turns them back on to help out the Duncan over there against the incoming dive bombers from the Lexington. Continues capping, uncontested again, because the Kunaberti is all the way over there. Gets spotted, instantly <laughs> pops his smoke. He's had quite enough of that, thank you. He has the hydro running. Dead ahead. Spots the torpedoes. Which hopefully, since they've been spotted, the rest of his team are going to be able to dodge. Continuing the cap, closing in on the submarine, who probably has no idea he's coming. And provided he doesn't shoot at anything, and that Kunaberti remains hidden in his smoke, he should be able to sneak up on and get a good depth charge attack against... Ooh, Kunaberti's popped up again. No, it's okay. He's on the opposite side of the smokescreen. He cannot see Jedi. And the temptation here to finish that guy off must be pretty overwhelming. But he does not want the submarine to know he's here. All 
There he is. Hydro's got him. Right. There may be an opportunity for a double strike here. He's going to want to get the death charges away first, though. Although he is about to get to within 6.2 kilometres of that converti, so he will be spotted and have to start shooting before he can get the death charges away. The submarine knows he's here. Way too late for him to do anything about it. That submarine captain's life is probably flashing before his eyes right now. Depth charge attack away. Shots out at the Cunaberti. Misses. Doesn't get the kill, but the Cunaberti is down. The submarine is down. Takes a couple of big old hits there from the enemy ships clustered around their cap circle at Charlie. The only cap circle that the enemy team hold, by the way. Uh, but he's got the engine boost running. And he's getting the hell out of there. Fast. Should be able to go undetected any second now. There it is. Still has nearly 13,000 health. Still has two heals left, although he hasn't taken enough repairable damage just yet to justify using it. So things are looking pretty good. I mean, the team have lost three ships, but the enemy team have lost four, and Jedi's team have three of the four cap circles and are commanding, soon to be 200 point lead. Not having that amazing crawling smoke that the Hyder gets is a bit of a limiting factor, I suppose, in the Huron. Although he does have a heal, although a well-played Hyder, using its Hydro and its crawling smoke should rarely actually need to use a heal. Although, I don't know. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the Hyder. The Hyder's an amazing ship, and the combination of a long-duration Hydro and that creeping smoke screen is very, very useful. But in a high-tier battle like this, I mean, it's tier 9, there's a carrier that can spot you from the air, there was a submarine that could outspot you if it was being played properly, and there's usually a lot of radar around, and the crawling smoke, definitely a very powerful and useful tool, but I think, I think the Hyder's crawling smoke is probably more useful when the Hyder's top tier, in a tier 7 battle, and Juzi appears to agree with me, thank you for the input there, Juju. Um, but in these circumstances, when you're bottom tier in a tier 9 battle, that's right, Juzy. My, she is chatty today, but I agree that the heal is probably going to be more beneficial. I think in a high tier battle, I'd rather have the Huron than the Hyder. I know, I know, what heresy is this that you speak? Choosing anything over the Hyder, if the Hyder was available. The Hyder is a great ship, but I do think that under these kind of circumstances, the Huron is probably just that little bit better, well, better, no, more flexible, more useful. I mean, you've got nothing to complain about Canada, they're both great ships. And in a tier 7 battle, maybe even in a tier 8 battle, I'd rather have the Hyder. But Jedi is not in a tier 7, maybe even a tier 8 battle. And I think that heal is definitely going to be more useful. It's around about now where things suddenly start to go all Pete Tong for Jedi's team. They've just lost their Drake, and the enemy team are flipping cap circle delta and they've just lost their jean bart d and they're still ahead but not by much jedi's got some torpedoes away against the pommen over there and they are looking pretty good no they're not <laughs> the pommen sailed out of torpedo range okay yeah that's what you get for opening your big mouth jingle you might have noticed that in common with uh, British and other Commonwealth destroyers, the Huron has the ability to ripple fire its torpedoes. So it doesn't have widespread, it's got narrow spread and single fire only. Unfortunately, the torpedo launchers don't start reloading until you've fired all four of the torpedoes. So you can't fire one and then have it reload that one to have a full set of torpedoes ready to go. Once that one's reloaded, you wait for them all to be empty and then it starts reloading which is a bit of a bummer but hey what are you gonna do meanwhile things are about to get a little bit worse the team are about to lose their aircraft carrier have a quick look at the northern end of the channel mouth that runs between the two islands in the middle of the map that is the carrier yeah sunk by the alaska because of course he was what the hell was he playing at he must have thought he was one of the escort carriers in Taffy 2 at the Battle of the Philippine Sea. We've got them now, boys. They're in 40mm gun range. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of boneheaded plays, 
There's the enemy Dmitri Donskoy, and Jedi just got himself radon. And Jedi probably felt the bottom dropping out of his world when that happened. Radon during the cyclone? Oh shit. But, I don't know what this Dmitri Donskoy is playing at. I mean, that thing is deadly against destroyers. Look at the rate of fire on its guns. But what's he doing? He's not even looking at Jedi. No, he's he's trying to close in the suicide torpedo range against the rest of Jedi's teammates and completely ignoring the battering that he's taking because the Dimitri Donskoy is a powerful ship, but it's a very fragile one. He's about to turn to try to get his torpedoes away. He's like, ha-ha, I have you now. No, you don't, sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> you really don't. Unfortunately, the Dmitry Donskoy just committed suicide by Iowa and Duncan at almost exactly the same time as the enemy Masashi finished off uh, Jedi's team's U-190 with its depth charge attack planes. So the scores are still more or less neutral with Jedi's team having a very slim points advantage but they now control only one of the four cap circles, with the enemy team holding two and the third about to be flipped as well. And they also have a numbers disadvantage. Quick word about what the Dimitri Donskoy just did though, because it did look really stupid, but honestly, under the circumstances, I don't think he really had that much of a choice. Because he got spotted before he used his radar. That's why he used the radar. And he used the radar to find well, a Huron off on his flank, a Rune, a Duncan, and an Iowa right in front of him. So, if he just turned around and tried to run, he would have died even faster than he did. So, yeah. I mean, he attempted to get in, fire off his torpedoes, then escape up the central channel. But, it would have been a miracle if it had worked, but it was his best option. Meanwhile, Jedi's just found himself the Pommon. And the Pommon's secondaries are nothing to mess around with. That's right, Juicy. Yes, it has German secondaries. They are very, very good. Wow, she's just full of conversation today, isn't she? The enemy team are now firmly ahead on points, of course, because they still have a carrier, the Indomitable, and they've just sunk the Duncan with it. And they're having a damn good try at sinking Jedi with it, too. He didn't want to hang around inside secondary range of the Pommon. He managed to get the torpedoes away. Then got spotted by aircraft, fortunately took only minor damage from the Indomitable's carpet bombers. He's managed to go undetected again. I don't know if you've noticed, by the way, but they've introduced new sound effects. So if you listen, and I've got the background volume up loud enough, you can hear that when there's a cyclone on, it actually sounds like there's a cyclone on, instead of just a mildly rainy and overcast day. Anyway, enemy team are now well over 100 points ahead, and they're continuing to push those cap circles, with the only cap in Jedi's team's possession now being the one that the enemy team started off with. And the Jedi only has three surviving teammates. And I'm reasonably sure that the enemy team know where the Rune and at least the Iowa are, because the Pommon and the Donskoy were just spotting them, and somebody flipped that cap at Charlie. So they're coming in from three different directions. Down the channel, in between the two islands. The Pommon is over in that direction, possibly also the Masashi. And they're swinging around from the west as well. This is not looking good, and it's getting worse with every passing second. Okay, the Cyclone is now passing. Spotting range is slowly increasing. The enemy is about to win. There's the Pommon again putting shots out against the Iowa, trying to slap his broadside as he comes around the corner of the island and turns north. There's the Masashi. What was the team doing? Well, they're all splitting up. Have a look at the minimap. The Rune has turned back to engage the Alaska. And, well, he's managed to get the Cossack, but have a look at what's just a couple of kilometers to the north of him. He's basically engaging in his own little suicide mission. Although it is going pretty well, he's managed to take out the Alaska as well. And rather than do what the Donskoy did and charge headlong into all of those enemy ships up to the north of Cap Circle Alpha, he's turning around and attempting to disengage. But the fact that the Cyclone is lifting is not going to help him. We can't see his health bar from here, but we can see the health bars of the Pommet and the Sovetsky Soyuz that he's kiting away from while peppering with long-range high explosive fire and zigzagging like his life depends on it because it kind of does. 
And that rune, as Jedi, attempts to set a sneaky fire before popping into cover behind the island here. That rune is actually playing the... Well, maybe not the game of his life, but certainly the last three minutes of his life. And he's managed to take the pommen out as well. <laughs> what an absolute rock star that guy is. Meanwhile, Jedi and the Iowa... They've gotten rid of the Pommen on this flank, but that just leaves the Indomitable and the Masashi. And those shots whizzing across the bottom of the screen, that's the Masashi. With its 18.1 inch guns, smacking the crap out of the Iowa. And it's here where the Iowa makes a pretty bad decision. I mean, Jedi's probably not complaining because the Iowa is focusing on the Indomitable as well. Unfortunately, the rune went down, the Sovetsky Soyuz finally finished him off. I suppose that was fairly inevitable. Look at the broadside that the Iowa is giving to the Masashi, while also taking the majority of the attention uh, from the Indomitable. Now, the Iowa gets a bit of relief here as he slips in behind the island over there on the left, shielding him momentarily from fire from the Masashi, who has managed to go undetected, as has Jedi. Uh, the Terrible is busy, well, he's attempting to flip the cap circle over at Alpha, but with the Sovetsky Soyuz about to nose into that cap circle, uh, he's probably going to have to make a run for it. He's on very, very low health. He's attempting to torpedo the Sovetsky Soyuz, of course, so you never know. Fingers crossed he might get lucky. Meanwhile, Jedi and the Iowa have taken the cap circle at Delta. The Masashi has popped back up, but the Iowa is tunnel visioning on the carrier. And he's not quite given a flat broadside to the Masashi over there. But the Masashi has taken advantage of it. Oh, the Terribles managed to get the Sovetsky Soyuz. Fantastic. Both teams now have two caps. You can see the Iowa's return shots against the Masashi there. Who is, to be fair, given a nice big broadside to the Iowa as well. And the Iowa's 16-inch super heavy armor piercing shells are nothing to be sniffed at. But he's not using his armor piercing shells. He's firing high explosive. And it's already too late for the Iowa, because instead of angling against the Masashi and sailing west to flip the cap circle at Bravo there and maybe survive, he's guaranteeing that he's going to die by continuing to give broadside to the Masashi's 18.1 inch armor piercing shells. And it looks like he's now tunnel visioning. Oh, wow. Well, oh, actually, those torpedoes are looking pretty good. Amazingly, the Iowa is still alive. Poor shooting from the Masashi, who's about to eat a bunch of torpedoes. Nice hits, not enough to save the Iowa, however. I think maybe the Iowa thought he could get this island between him and the Masashi's guns. But in order to do that, he had to show broadside to the Masashi for at least a minute and a half, when sailing away to the west and flipping that cap circle at Bravo would have allowed him to tank to a degree, at least, the Masashi's 18.1 inch shells. And, well, yeah, it didn't work. He's dead. Because of course he is. Bunch of poor decisions from the Iowa there. Mostly sailing broadside to a Masashi in order to try to get a kill on a carrier that he could have continued to shoot at by angling away from the Masashi. If the Iowa had made the right choice there, he could have been the Eagle, but he ended up being the Turkey. Oh well, never mind. Two on two. Now Jedi has the island between himself and the Masashi and the Terrible is too far away to help him directly so Jedi is of course getting the full attention of the Indomitable's dive bombers but I think it's fairly safe to say the Indomitable is probably panicking a little here. <laughs> I mean, you would, wouldn't you? And there's the torpedo. Come on, finish him off. Come on, one more salvo, surely. No? Oh, all right, one more. No, another one. Finally, got him. And that just leaves the Masashi. Oh, the terrible trying to ninja the kill at the <laughs> last second there. <laughs> it's not ninjaing a kill, okay? It's supporting your teammates. That just leaves the Masashi, and a battleship alone against two destroyers would probably be sweating bullets right now, but they don't need to get him. They're ahead on points, they're gonna win. And there isn't time to get him anyway, because that is it. The full 20 minutes. And I really enjoyed that game. I mean, kudos to Jedi, obviously. But 
right up until the last minute, you couldn't tell which team was going to win. And while those landslide victories where one team just utterly crushes the other one in 10 minutes, they can be amusing to watch as well. There's definitely a place for that kind of video. I find that, you know, too many of them get real boring real fast. And I much prefer watching this kind of battle where you can never really tell which side's going to win and the lead flips from one team to the other multiple times during the course of the match. And hopefully you agree, because, well, if you're still here, and that's what you just spent 20 minutes watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And I hope Jedi starts streaming again more often. I'll put the link to his Twitch channel down below in the video description. Because I do enjoy watching him play and he just really doesn't stream enough. So Jedi, stop slacking. Get back on Twitch. Anyway, that's it. Hope you all enjoyed it. Hope you're all having a great day. And as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.